All right, uh, welcome everyone to the fourth and final installment of the Silage for Beef uh, webinar series, which was uh, originally planned as a conference to be held in Mead, Nebraska in June. And uh, with the COVID-19 situation, we pivoted to a virtual format. And this is the fourth of the four webinars that are uh, part of this program. Uh, to follow these up, there will also be a series of podcasts, and, and Galen will give you more information on those that are hosted by the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. So with that, we'll turn it over to our speaker for today. Galen Erickson is the uh, Nebraska Cattle Industry Professor of Animal Science in the Department of Animal Science at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. He's also the Extension Beef Feedlot Specialist. He received his PhD in 2001 from the University of Nebraska. And um, he's also an Iowa native, I have to point that out, and Galen received his undergrad degree from Iowa State, so we claim him as well. Uh, his research and act, uh, extension activities have focused on the utilization of byproducts in growing and finishing cattle, uh, us using alternatives to grain, including corn silage, and the interaction between nutrition management, environmental issues, uh, and, and including air and nutrient management and growth technologies. So with that, Galen, I'm going to turn it over to you, and uh, I look forward to hearing about silage and management, or silage feeding and management for beef cattle in the current environment. Galen? Yeah, thanks, Dan. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for joining us and, and watching this webinar. You know, it's it's been to try and organize some of our meetings, um, basically to do it this way instead of the way we had back in June. Appreciate that there's a lot of interest so in silage and how to use it and so we're going to focus today on corn silage and then i think down the road as we get more data and and more things to discuss related to small grain silages and so on you know those things can be important too but today is going to be pretty heavily focused as have the previous webinars on corn silage and at the end uh we'll come back and and there's going to be some podcasts that'll be new speakers as well as uh sort of shortened versions of what we're talking about by each of the four speakers on the webinar series. And we'll host all of those uh, at Lalamond, uh, Iowa State Beef Center, and, and uh, beef.unl.edu. I'm gonna talk about silage, obviously, and, and um, it said, though, in the current environment, and, and then as I was thinking about the current environment, we don't want to date the webinar too much, but this last 12 months probably couldn't be a lot crazier um lots of issues which are everybody is well aware of which i'm not going to get into but if we focus in on corn price um distillers and 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 obviously we could talk about cattle prices although i won't get into that either but just looking at corn we price at the first week of the month every uh every month at our co-ops at mead for price our corn at our research station and in the last 12 months that's been from uh, 373 to 280. Obviously, it was 320 here the first week of July. Um, we're collecting those prices here the first week of August of 2020. So quite a range in corn price that we've seen, obviously, with a drop in the spring uh, here in the summer. The stiller's grains price, because of supply issues, we either ran out or now maybe overflowing, and that obviously influences price. So again, I'm aware of prices in the neighborhood of 70% of corn price to 180% or more of corn price just in the last 12 months. So clearly a uh, variable time and uh, challenging time for planning and, and economics in our cattle operations. Now, for this spring, when there were some dis uh, supply disruptions, for those operations that had silage, one of the pluses was that at least in the very short term basis allowed you to have some substitution for ingredients that may have been difficult to get in. So that's something to bear in mind, maybe for some resiliency on when, uh, when you really are in a bind and run out. Obviously, uh, you know, we're into what the previous three webinars have been heavily focused on managing the process of putting up silage now we're going to talk some about how it's used but maybe most importantly um, <clears throat> delve into some of the economics and ways to price it and uh, we put up a lot of silage in our research system this is a, a pile of silage at our at our research uh, beef unit uh, 
And uh, just like everybody, we have a little spoilage on the top. And uh, that's okay, because what we're doing, we want to mimic what a producer would do. So I have two columns here. One is maybe some of the why silage should be considered, maybe some of why not. Um, so one of the benefits of silage is you guarantee the supply. Back to that disruption and resilience issue. Um, if you have it put up in the fall, you know you have it. Downside of that is money's tied up maybe in that pile. Um, and that, that varies from producer to producer and how big of an issue that is. I think the price relative to hay is a no brainer, which we're gonna get into. And everybody says, well, silage is a high shrink ingredient. Hay shrink too, especially if you measure shrink from the point of, of actually baling until uh, grinding and delivery, if that's the way that's, that hay is handled. Many people say, well, it's cheaper grain, um, silage isn't as beneficial then. Well, cheaper grain also translates to cheaper silage, it is fair to point out that the more expensive grain gets, there is usually a little better opportunity for more use of silage relative to corn. Um, for sure, we want to evaluate all of these ingredients on a dollars per unit of energy. Today, I'm going to use TDN. Most people are probably familiar with TDN, total digestible nutrients. Again, it's just a measure of energy content, most commonly used in forages but it is, is, a, is a universal way to, to compare ingredients. The benefit I think of, about with silage is it's processed and ready to feed once it's uh, through the ensiling process. So there's no further processing required and it does add moisture. We experience some of those issues when we have supply disruptions on our wet byproducts. We've sort of taken for granted the benefits of moisture and holding the diet together and mixing. Okay. Why would you not do silage? Well, it does require specialized equipment for harvest. Um, you can use a custom operator. There are implications to that. Most importantly, probably of not always being able to dictate when harvest occurs. Certainly you need to have a place to put this. That was discussed some. Um, a concrete pad would be ideal to minimize uh, uh, shrink and spoilage. You can have makeshift, makeshift bunkers though and um, and that works and is possible if designed correctly. I have a question here, is it too good for cows? I'll come back to that here in a while, um, but you can limit feed it. it do, you do have to handle a lot of moisture. It's two thirds moisture roughly or, or so. And, um, and so you're gonna be dealing with handling water and that may or may not be an issue. And then obviously when you put up silage as has been well documented in our previous webinars and everybody's hopefully quite familiar with you got to have a lot of management employed, a lot of management considerations, especially at the time of harvest. Okay, so what I'm going to try and do in the next 30 minutes or so, <coughs> excuse me, is, is first talk about economics and how to price silage. And I guess I think convince you hopefully that it's quite economical, which is why we've been working on it and doing quite a bit of research with it. Uh, gonna, then I'm going to talk about what are the applications on the finishing cattle side, what are applications in the backgrounding side, and then a little bit on, on cows at the end. And not because cows are important, but because it's, it's frankly a little bit straightforward and I think that'll be clear. Okay, so most critical, and so the first part of this, I want to talk about how you price silage. There are multiple calculators. Um, uh, we happen to use the ISU silage calculator. There is a Wisconsin silage calculator. And there's a few caveats though that I want to point out that I think are important. Even with you've downloaded it and you've used it, I still think it's important to, to maybe think, consider a few things. First and foremost, we need the price uh, grain in the field. And at silage time, I think this is important to understand, and there still seems to be debate about this. At dry corn harvest, it's about 60% grain, 40% forage. But at silage time, it is 50 to 52% grain. That means uh, 48 to 50% forage. And that, that varies with when you're gonna harvest up until black layer, but for almost everybody that's in that silage, optimum silage harvesting window, it's pretty clear cut, it's 50% grain. There is a yield drag because it's not been to black layer. Wisconsin has collected probably the best data that I'm familiar with in the world 
on that that drag of yield. In other words, how much more grain is possible between the time you cut silage until black layer? And their data, as well as the University of Nebraska data, suggests the 6% yield, yield drag is important to understand. I also think you can use starch analysis in your silage as a proxy for how much grain's there. And so if you use, if you analyze your silage and you get a percent starch analysis, you divide that number by 0.7, that's a proxy for how much grain is in there. Now, why do you have to know that? Because everybody can measure yield of silage as is tons. Almost everybody does that. And if you're not, I would strongly encourage you to, that, to do that. So you're measuring wet weight taken off on a per acre basis on silage. Hopefully then you do a dry matter on that green chop because that's really important. So now you know dry matter tons that are, that are hauled off per acre as silage. But in that silage, you've got to get to how much grain is in that ton of dry matter of silage. That's why some of these things are important to understand of how much grain is there on a dry basis, how much more grain would you have gotten if you had gone to dry corn? Because that's what we're trying to compare to. If you have that field of corn, is it better for you to let it go to dry corn or is it better to cut it for silage? And if you're going to cut it for silage, you got to offset the economics that you would have gotten if you'd gone to dry corn. So you need to measure moisture or dry matter at the time of harvest. That's also important for shrink. But if you harvest silage, you don't have to combine the corn. So you subtract off the, the cost of combining. You also don't have to haul the corn to market. Now, for many people, they don't account for that. But uh, the corn is, if corn's $3.20 a bushel today, it's not $3.20 per bushel on the plant in the field. Because you got to combine it to get it off the field, and then you got to haul it to the closest market. That could be just across the road. That could be miles and miles away. In some locations, you may have a drying cost as well. That varies depending upon those inputs, but it's about 50 cents per bushel. Our numbers suggest, and I'll show you this with data, is that 7.65 times the corn price of corn in September and October is a good estimate for what your silage price, as is tons, is at the time of harvest standing in the, of buying that corn standing in the field. And that doesn't vary depending upon corn price hardly at all. Okay, one of the mistakes that, that we've made early on, and I think is still made, is people, if corn is $3.20 per bushel right now when we want to harvest silage, it is not $3.20 next spring. It goes up over the course of the year. And the reason that price go, this is a line showing percent change from 2004 to 2013 in price of both corn in blue and uh, beans in red, that obviously that corn price goes up throughout the year until we get to the following September, October, when there is a new harvest. And that price increase is a direct reflection of the cost to store the grain. And so this is data on cumulative storage costs, uh, either on farm or commercially. And you can see that somewhere and the reason it jumps out to 20 or 30 cents per bushel right away is because there's a storage, there, there's a building or an infrastructure that's got to be built that's a fixed cost. And then per month goes up gradually over time. So somewhere on average, we increase the price of corn 30 to 40 cents per bushel as we store that corn throughout the year on average. Why does that matter? Because if I price the silage in the field and use an average corn grain cost throughout the year, that grain price has storage included. That's not fair because in a little bit, we're gonna charge storage costs to the silage. You can't charge storage costs in the grain price and storage costs in the silage price. And I think that's a mistake we've made, and I'll, I'll illustrate that here more. So when you're comparing silage to corn, you really got to, uh, so, so now I bought corn in the silage at 320 per bushel, but that price is probably 350 if I'm gonna look at, do I feed corn or do I feed silage later throughout the rest of the year? So you're comparing it to a more expensive corn grain price. Uh, corn silage price has storage added in it. Corn price goes up because of storage, corn grain price. 
So you need to buy the corn for the fall price, but you're comparing it to corn that you would feed throughout the rest of the year, which also has storage costs in it for silage. So uh, I guess my point is you don't compare 350 corn grain in the silage and 350 corn grain that you're going to feed when corn is 320 in the fall. And that's a pretty close example to where we're at today. Second critical thing is everybody wants to charge for nutrient removal in the forage when we harvest silage. And I understand that. And how do we come up with that estimated cost? We pay fertilizer price for those nutrients. What I don't think is fair, though, is then if I'm feeding cattle and I have manure and I can replenish those same exact nutrients, no one wants to pay fertilizer price for those nutrients. And that's not fair. And so if you own the field and you own the cattle, it doesn't really matter because you're trading it with, uh, from one hand to the other. But if you're buying silage from your neighbor, and then trying to sell manure back to your neighbor and they're not willing to pay fertilizer price for the new nutrients, you shouldn't have get charged fertilizer price for the forage that's removed from the field. That's the concept. And if we account for that manure, uh, that changes the economics of the silage as well. So here's an example. Um, and there's, there's a lot of things on here and this is gonna be published in our 2021 Nebraska Beef Report. But this is a, essentially a summary table from the Iowa State silage uh, uh, calculator, price calculator. And we look at what's the price of the silage of the grain in that field on a per ton of silage basis. At 320 corn, the price for that grain is $26 per ton. Now, you, uh, you, uh, you could harvest some of the dry corn stover. So the Iowa State calculator accounts for that. In this scenario, I think I used 25% uh, removal of stover. You have the fertilizer with what we just talked about, the fertilizer nutrients that are having to replenish what's removed in the forage. But if we add back in um, 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 the, the cost from using manure, then that offsets that cost, but we also got to have a cost for spreading the manure. So this is the manure nutrients going back on, which is a credit. This is uh, the manure cost of spreading it that we got to add on to our silage cost. Then if you, if you uh, have to dry and store your uh, corn grain, there's the cost on a per ton of silage basis. So ultimately we get to about 7.65 times 3.2 for standing in the field, assuming some of the manure is recycled. Harvesting cost and storage costs, a lot of debate about that. Maybe it's 10 to $12 per ton. This is listed at 13.25. There's shrink on silage. So you get down here eventually to uh, basically the feed value cost of that silage is about 11 and a half to 12 times that original 320. Here's the key. If I use this price of 30, I think it was 37.84, and I convert it to a dry ton price, that's just around $100 per dry ton, $103. My corn that I would compare it to, at least in a feedlot situation, or to supplement energy to backgrounding cattle is $150 a dry ton, 148. Now, how did I get $148 a dry ton? I used 350 per bushel. So remember what I said before, we're buying silage at 320 corn, but if we wanna feed it to, as an energy supplement to growing calves, I could, I'd have to buy 350 corn throughout the rest of the year, uh, at least on a year average. So that's how the math works out. If you look at the percentage of that, that's 69% the price of corn. If I don't do what I just suggested and I use 320 corn, it's $135 a dry ton, that's 76% the value of corn. Just a little forewarning, anytime it's less than 80% the price of corn, it's a per unit of TDN, it's a better buy. So one of the most critical things, use the right corn price when you price the silage, especially standing in the field. You have to account for the 6% yield drag. Uh, you need to account for this change on whether I'm buying corn to put in the silage in the fall 
and I'm comparing it to corn throughout the rest of the year. That corn on a year average basis is probably 30 cents per bushel higher on a year year average. You have to value the manure um, or you shouldn't get charged for nutrient removal, one or the other. You have to manage shrink, which is what we've talked about. And I'll come back to that briefly. Anything less than 80% of corn price is profitable then to use T, uh, silage on a TDN basis. And that's because on average, which is not great to use just an average, but on average TDN of silage is 72. On average for finishing cattle, the TDN for corn is 90, which is 80%. Now I have to point out, which confuses a lot of people, that if you're talking about feeding forage to cattle, so either growing cattle fed a forage diet or to cows, corn has a TDN of 83, not 90. The reason why is because of the negative associative effect of supplementing corn in forage diets. And a lot of people get confused about that. Uh, you just have to accept that corn has a TDN of 83 or around there in growing diets or forage diets and a TDN of 90 in corn-based diets. So my point is, is that if if I use it, if I'm going to have an opportunity to, to supplement corn to growing cattle on a forage diet or corn silage, now if my silage is less than 87% the price of corn, it's a good buy. So it's a really good buy for growing cattle and for cows, generally speaking. The example I gave earlier, it varied from 70 to 76% of corn price, depending upon what, what you put in and what you value. Now, as, as was alluded to uh, over the last three weeks in talking about shrink in the, in the webinar series, I think there's, there's a lot of people that are measuring shrink or not measuring it correctly. So I just wanna emphasize this point. You have to measure dry matter in and dry matter delivered to the cattle. A lot of people measure the yield of silage on as is tons, but they don't take a sample and know the moisture content then they measure as is tons that they take out of the bunker and they do measure the moisture content when they remove it. But if you don't measure the dry matter going in, then uh, you erroneously calculate shrink. And my example is outlined here, but the reason why you it's erroneous to measure shrink on an as is basis is because silage does generally get wetter while it, when, it, when it's fermented in the bunker. On average, we think that's around one percentage unit. So in other words, if I put up green chop at 37% dry matter, 63% moisture, and then I take out silage after it's gone through the fermentation process the rest of the year, it'll be 36% dry matter or 64% water. Now, why does that matter? Because if I just measured as is tons going in and as is tons coming out, I would think my shrink was under 10%. When in reality, in my assumptions here, the shrink was 12% on a dry matter basis. So I think you underestimate shrink if you don't measure the dry matter of green chop going in. Okay, so as you can tell, I spent most of the discussion on how to price and, and, and how to accurately account for getting the silage. Because once it's priced correctly, whether you own the fields and own the silage and own the cattle, but especially important if you're buying silage or if you're selling silage to your neighbors, it's critically important to get a fair and accurate price. And I, I think we've made lots of progress in that arena in the last five to eight years. Okay, now I wanna shift to some feeding things. And I'm gonna go through these fairly quickly. Uh, a lot of this information is available um, and, and happy to provide that uh, and it's online as well. So we've done a lot of work starting about uh, seven years ago when we, uh, eight years ago, when we saw that corn prices were likely gonna increase, should we be looking at feeding more silage than normal? Normal amounts of silage that finishing, uh, that feedlots would generally use for finishing would be less than 15% of the diet. So we've done numerous experiments um, comparing feeding 15% silage to 45% silage. And this is a summary of, of those experiments. So there's 58 pen means in this comparison, which is certainly well replicated. So when we increase the silage in the diet, roughly triple it uh, on a dry matter basis, generally speaking, we didn't see a big change in dry matter intake. Cattle fed more silage, which was replacing corn gained less per day, 
and feed conversions got worse. So uh, we've been saying you should feed more silage and it hurts gain and hurts feed conversions. And so about, oh, 0% of the people in the world have adopted that practice. And I understand that, but I understand why initially you would say not to do that. But the, here's the kicker. We believe, which I'm going to show you, is that it's more economical to feed the 45% silage despite the lower gain and despite the 7% poor feed, feed conversion. And that's in diets today, typical of what we would see with 20 to 40% distillers in the diet. And so not, not different than what you've done. But since no one's adopted it, um, we wanted to look at another thing. And what we looked at was a lot of people want to feed cattle silage growing diets when they first come into the yard, background those cattle for a period of time, then step them down on silage and up on grain, and then finish them out. And so this experiment was done a, a couple years ago and we compared feeding 15% silage in black line, 45% silage in the blue line. And then we compared that to a third treatment where for the first half of the feeding period, roughly, they got 75% silage, which would be very typical in a growing diet. And then we dropped that 75 to 15 for the second half of the experiment. Now, if you're good at math, you will quickly know that if you, on average, you feed 75 for the first half and 15% for the second half, on average, you feed exactly 45% throughout the whole feeding period. What this figure here shows, though, is what happened to the fatness of those cattle with increasing days on feed. And the reason we wanted to do this is because if cattle are fed more silage, they're not going to fatten as rapidly and we have to feed them longer. And we wanted to estimate how much longer should we feed them to get them the same fat depth. So we took uh, an ultrasound of back fat um, at re-implant time. We took another ultrasound about day 125, and then we slaughtered the 15% cattle because we thought that they were gonna get to exactly 0.6 inches of back fat, which is the industry average. So we slaughtered them about day 154 from what I remember, I'll show you here in a minute. And then we had the cattle being fed 45% silage all the way through that we fed longer. And then we had this group in red, which is the 75% silage first half, 15% the second half. And again, we thought we'd get them all to the same fatness. We didn't get them all exactly to the same fatness. And I wanna point out why is because the ones fed 15% silage, the line slowed down and we're not sure why, doesn't matter, but that's why they don't all get to about the same fatness. Okay, so what happened to performance? Cattle fed 153 days, 15% silage, gained four pounds a day, conversions of five, nine. Carcass weights of 830, 830 pounds, and back fat was that 0.53 inches. If we fed 45% silage all the way through, gains were 3.8, conversions of 6.17, so it's worse. Notice that carcass weights are heavier. The reason they're heavier is because our days on feed went to 181. Remember to get them the same fatness. Now it looks like we fed them too long and got them too fat, but remember the graph that these guys didn't, didn't keep fattening like we thought. Then we have this 75% silage for the first half, 15% silage for the second half. Gains were the same as the 45 silage at 3.7. Conversions were identical at 6.17. Carcass weights a little less, but statistically the same at 866. Net result down here at the bottom is probably the critical one. If you price silage correctly, if we make the cattle fed the 15% silage um, uh, for 153 days break even, you make 30 to 40 more dollars feeding more silage. So if you own the cattle, you own the silage, you are finishing those cattle as, as, a, as a private feedlot, we think there's an opportunity to, even though you're gonna hurt gain and hurt feed conversion some, we think there's an opportunity to make more money. More recently, I just wanna share this quickly, is more recently we did a study that was funded by the Iowa Beef Council 
Um, and we looked at feeding silage at 15 and 45 percent, and we fed the 15 percent silage cattle 185 days. The the 45 percent silage we fed 213 days. We got them to the same exact fatness. But in this study, what we did is we either did not feed them Thailand for control of liver abscesses, or we did feed them Thailand. And so just like before, we saw that feeding 45 percent silage uh, depressed average daily gain, but if you fed them longer, carcass weights were heavier, and conversions went from about 6.2 at 15% silage to around 7.2 um, with 45% silage. I got to point out that conversion of 6.34 was significantly worse without Thailand in the diet and 15% silage compared to feeding 15% silage with Thailand. So the, the Thailand fed in the control diets, the 15% silage did help conversions. The main point of this study was also liver abscesses. Notice that in 15% silage diets with no Thailand, total liver abscess rate was 34.5%. That decreased to just, uh, just over 19% when we fed Thailand. And if we fed 45% silage, the abscess rates were below 13% in both cases and not different. So we did this study because if now you're a private feeder and you're feeding more silage, especially if you own those crop acres, um, you're, you're, it's one alternative way to control liver abscesses is by feeding more silage. We've done quite a bit of work looking at feeding different hybrids. In this case, this is looking at brown midrib. You recall BMR or brown midrib silage is lower in lignin. We looked at feeding that that those hybrids, which in red are the BMR hybrids. There was two different ones. And in blue is kind of the control hybrids. Notice when we feed 45% silage, feeding the BMR tended to help gain and feed conversions. At uh, 15%, there was some noise, but really not a lot of difference across those hybrids, although this experimental one looked pretty good. We've done that work in just 40% inclusion, a control hybrid BMR and a BMR uh, experimental. And at 40% inclusion, uh, cattle ate a little more. These were big yearlings when they went on feed. They ate a little more, gained more, and conversions though were significantly better by feeding the BMR. So if you're gonna feed 40% silage instead of 15, we think there's an opportunity to start looking at hybrid selection might be a lot more critical BMR being one of them. Um, why is it? Why do they? Uh, why do they perform better? It's because it improves digestibility. This is some growing cattle. Uh, so these are 80% silage diets, and I think this is important to point out that BMR, because there's less lignin, increases digestibility. And so on a growing diet where gut fill is limiting intake. Cattle eat much more if you feed them a 80% silage diet that's BMR, uh, gain more, and feed conversions though were not different or not better. So the, the advantage of the, of the better digestible hybrid is they ate more, gained more, but efficiencies were about the same in growing situations. Digestibilities were improved in, in work we've done looking at digestibilities primarily in the BMR hybrids because it increases fiber or NDF, neutral detergent fiber, digestibilities in those diets when we feed 80% silage with a BMR hybrid. We've more recently done some work, uh, it's published in the 2020 beef report with a company called Master's Choice. They had developed a hybrid that, that had, that, that they from lab tests, they thought improved the fiber and starch digestibility characteristics of that silage. Uh, so JWA did this study, and again, it was published in 2020 beef report. Uh, growing cattle, starting out at 670 pounds, grown for about 84 days, up to about 1,000 pounds. Notice a uh, little bit of intake differences. This second master's choice hybrid is one that they thought might be a little better in fiber, but it's really kind of the old, uh, it's an older hybrid um, and they want to see kind of what's the effect of, of old and new in their comparison. And, uh, and you can see that this, this older hybrid, the cattle ate a little more than the two other growing treatments of either a control hybrid that we just grew at our farm or this MC1. 
cattle fed the MC1 gained the most numerically and was greater than the cattle fed the other master's choice hybrid. So there's a gain difference across hybrids that's possible. Our farm choice or our control hybrid was, was just in between. And then conversions were significantly different across all three. The best conversions, now again, these are 80% silage diets with 15% distillers and supplement, and we're getting gains of over four and conversions less than six. And so this is tremendous performance for the cattle on this, on this hybrid selected for improved fiber and starch characteristics. Uh, the worst one, although still is not bad, was the, uh, the, the other master's choice one. It's kind of the older hybrid. And then the control hybrid we had is in between. So to me, there is diversity in performance just due to how hybrids have been selected, which means there's potential to do even better. We've also done digestion work, which I don't want to dwell on, but the di organic matter digestibilities match perfectly with what we saw in terms of uh, of performance. We did not see a lot of difference in fiber digestibilities, but ultimately when you measure that the, the uh, energy digestibilities, they match again perfectly with what we saw in the performance study with the one hybrid selected for better fiber and starch, having the most energy digestibility, the highest DE content, and then the uh, other hybrid having the, low, the other master's choice having the lowest and the control being intermediate. Okay, I briefly then want to cover two other management kind of topics, and that is one is kernel processing or not. Uh, some of you probably have, maybe have seen this. This is work from a couple years ago where we fed 40% silage either without the kernel processing being run or with the kernel processing being run. And a lot of people said, well, I'm going to buy a kernel processor. We need to run it. But what's it do to performance if you process the kernels? Everybody says, well, dairies do it and it must help. There's actually not a lot of supporting evidence for that in the dairy industry. And so we wanted, and there was almost no data on kernel processing impact in beef cattle type diets. So these diets all have 40% silage. They ate a lot, but notice that the cattle that were fed silage at 40% of the diet that had been kernel processed ate less dry matter per day, gained identical, and there's a lot of replication in this in these treatments. There's 18 pens per treatment. They gained identical, which means the conversions were improved. This is a typical energy response where they got exactly the same gains, but it took less feed intake, which was ad libitum, to get to, to that gain, which then means there's an improve, improvement in conversion. So there's a 2.9% improvement in, in conversions. Now, again, that 3% that improvement in conversion is due to all of the kernel processing of the silage that was in 40% of the diet. So I think the silage, because it was kernel processed, is about 7% better, but the diet was only improved 3% because you fed it at 40% of the diet. Did another follow-up study, uh, McKenna Britton did, and she fed 80% of the diet as silage. There's 16 pens in each of these treatment comparisons, and... Uh, and saw a very similar response, maybe even more significant, and that is lower intake if cattle were fed a 80% silage that was kernel processed versus not. Gains uh, may be uh, increased, significantly was increased, but not a huge change, but is higher at gain and therefore better feed conversions. Again, 80% of the diet is silage, 15% of, si of the diet is distiller's grains, and uh, and we conclude here that kernel processing improved the silage six and a half percent. So if someone says, should I kernel process or not? What's it do to the silage? We think it improves the silage six to seven percent, uh, six and a half to seven percent when fed to beef cattle. Okay, one critical thing. So we've kind of talked about finishing cattle. We've talked a little bit about growing cattle in there, but with growing cattle. I think it's critical to look at protein. And the reason why is we've been doing a lot of work on silage and we think that the silage is actually quite low in, in bypass protein. And if you're gonna grow calves on a silage based diet, they're gonna be short on protein. And the type of protein that the diet's gonna need is bypass protein uh, or what we'd call RUP, rumen undegradable protein. 
So we've done numerous studies showing a, an RUP response for gain uh, as we feed a silage growing diet. So as we add bypass protein or, or this, uh, in this case, um, uh, RUP, rumen undergradable protein, then you increase gain. And uh, that's been well documented. And there's a lot of other work though that looks at just adding protein, but we think it's critical that, that you're adding RUP. If your source of RUP is distiller's grains, which by the way is the best source in terms of economics available today, the cheapest source of RUP available to a beef producer today is distiller's grains. And the reason, and so distiller's grains are about 30% protein, about two thirds of that protein is bypass protein. And um, so it's high in RUP and yet relatively inexpensive. So my point is, if you look at these data, there's there's statistically it was a, a linear response. We think it's curvilinear in shape. So I guess it depends on whether you think the statistics say this is linear, or if you think the statistics should say that it's quadratic. You need somewhere around 16 to 27 percent stillers grains to provide the RUP that we saw respond in this study. So our recommendation is this is that on a dry basis, if you're going to background calves, uh, you've got to feed 15% distillers along with 80% silage and then maybe a little bit of supplement for limestone and so on. And that your response to that RUP is, is usually early in the feeding period. So the calves in, in one of these studies that was uh, Colt Noni's, I believe, uh, the first 37 days is when we saw the greatest improvement in gain from RUP. And that's because the younger and lighter those calves are, the more RUP is required to get the kind of gains that we want them to get. Okay, the other question then is, is when should I harvest? And so we've tried to look at work on when is optimum harvest. If you look at this, this is some work from our 2016 Nebraska Beef Report. Uh, this zero here is black layer. So this is one week prior to black layer, two weeks. So this is weeks before reaching black layer. And this is obviously weeks after black layer. The point of this slide is a couple things. One, the percent grain that is in the silage, if you cut it as forage and grain, so the whole plant, the percent grain um, goes up. I think there's a mistake there, I apologize goes up from 45% as a percent of the of the mix is grain to maybe as high as 60% out here at dry corn. But notice that it kind of goes up to that 50 to 52% range when we're cutting silage. The other thing I want to point out is that actually silage yield is greatest at black layer. Now, why is that the case? Is because grains maximized and yet you didn't start to lose any of the forage. Once the, once, the, and once the crop reaches black layer, now you're starting to lose forage and maintain grain. So the grain stays constant, but the forage is disappearing. Obviously, silage dry matter can change rapidly. It's going from the low 30s to upper 30s, low 40s, and then all the way up to even uh, uh, almost 60%. So there's a lot of change, I guess, is the point of this slide that's happening in a relatively small amount of time. I'm worried that we are cutting silage over here when it's way too early. And obviously you can't go past black layer. So we want to look at comparing maybe something that's here that's more normal in the 30s, you know, mid 30s to something over here that's drier at black layer. So that's what we did. Uh, we, we put up silage and the green chop was either 37% dry matter or 43% dry matter. Same field, same crop, same timing, other than this was about two weeks later. And then we fed those drier silages. And if you look at this data, we fed it at 15% or 45%. And within the 15% or within the 45%, it didn't matter whether we fed the, the normal silage or the drier silage. It didn't impact gain didn't impact feed, feed conversion at the 45% inclusion or the 15. When we fed it though to growing calves, the drier silage didn't feed as well. 
So these are some growing calves that we fed from 600 pounds up as eight weights um, for about 84 days. And notice the gains were 3-2. If we fed the, the normal silage at 37% dry matter, and it was under three if we fed the drier silage and conversions were worse. And we think that's because of fiber digestibility was poor for the drier silage. So I do, I, don't, I do think there's an optimum time to harvest. And I don't think, I think too many times we harvest a little too wet and that we really need to target 37, 38% dry matter as our target harvest time. That'd be obviously 62 to 63% more moisture. Okay, the last thing I want to wrap up with then is the cows part. Cow energy requirements are a little tougher. We've not done any direct comparisons of supplementing corn versus corn silage. Uh, some of that work's been done over, over history. I just wanted to simplify this, and I did that in one slide. If you look at cow energy requirements, in other words, how much TDN does a cow require? It varies across the year with whether she's lactating uh, gestating or, or just dry, and especially if she's dry and not gestating. So somewhere around 14 to 15 pounds of TDN is required during lactation, depending upon, that'd be kind of peak lactation. And then obviously that drops to maybe a low of 10 pounds or so of TDN when they're dry or in early gestation. Silage TDN is about 72%. That's a pretty good average number, probably uh, varies some. But if we just use an average TDN value of 72, and that cow needs a low of 10 pounds of TDN and a high of 15 pounds, I look at it as being fairly simple. You could feed anywhere from 14 to 20 pounds of, of silage, dry matter, not as is, dry matter, and meet the cow's requirement. She would eat, if you gave her unlimited access to silage, she'd eat 30 to 35 pounds of dry matter easily. So, and, it, and obviously on a wet basis, you got to take all those numbers times three. So I think too many times producers say, well, I'm feeding 40 or 50 pounds of silage. Yes, but there's a lot of water in that, number one. Number two, uh, I think if you want to really use silage, you got to combine it with other lower energy haze or residues to make a mixed ration that's ideal. Because of the moisture and the palatability, it's actually a good idea to mix it with lower quality forages that hopefully are cheaper as well. So the cow thing's a little different, but I think it's also pretty straightforward that silage is great and maybe too great or too good of energy and have to be either limited or mixed with other lower, lower energy ingredients. Okay, so to conclude, you know, we've talked a lot about this feeding of the 45% versus the 15. I do believe it's economical in most situations. But if you don't want to do that, you want to continue to grow the calves on silage and then finish them, that's fine too. Um, but if you're going to grow calves, you really got to think about feeding about 80% of the diet of silage and get some distiller's grains in those diets to help with the protein issue. Uh, some of these hybrids like the BMR uh, improve gain and improve intake, depends on whether that's a growing or finishing situation. There's other examples now that we're gathering, like the master's choice data that I showed, that show that hybrid selection could, could be an improvement for beef cattle, just like it's been looked at in the dairy side and so on. Kernel processing does improve the silage when fed to cattle. We think somewhere in the six and a half to 7% range as a feed ingredient. And if you're gonna, I said this before, but if you're gonna grow calves, you need to have an RUP source and, and I really believe, especially in most areas of the U.S., the Stillers range is, is by far your most economical source of that. I think we need to look more into the silage optimized harvest time, but look at the dairy information. Everybody kind of gravitates to this 37 to 38% moisture, um, which is 62 to 63%, uh, sorry, 37 to 38% dry matter, 60 And then we got to measure our shrink uh, correctly and uh, and try to do everything we can, like previous webinars have said, to keep that under 15%. And if you're going to buy silage, you got to price it correctly. I strongly encourage you to use some of these tools. And even within those tools, to get the manure credits correct, uh, to compare the corn price and only pay what the corn price is in the fall, because you don't want to pay storage on corn as well as storage on corn silage manage shrink, um, but with all those things that are done, it is clear to me that, that it's economical to use silage compared to corn as an energy supplement 
Um, and it's frankly, I use the word foolish to not you to, to, to use silage, to not use silage as your roughage source, especially compared to alternative roughages like haze and so on, given their price. So obviously my contact information is here, as Dan Loy alluded to, we have more information on our website as well as uh, we post on the Iowa State and uh, Lalamon sites for the podcast and so on. But uh, with that, I'd be happy to take any questions as, as they have alluded to, uh, type in your questions in the, in the chat box or into the Q&A and um, we will try to address them now. Dan? Okay, excellent, Galen. Uh, excellent job. We are we do uh, have several questions in the chat box, so we'll get right to them. Uh, the first question is, what's your opinion of the kernel processor and diets based on corn sorghum silage? Have you done anything with that, Galen? Corn, uh, corn and sorghum silage, or just sorghum? I'm sorry, I, I mispronounced it. Grain sorghum. So grain, grain sorghum. sorghum silage. I I mispronounced it. It's a good question that I don't know the answer to. Um, the the grain sorghum have smaller berries. Um, obviously, most of the sorghum silage that's put up is is the forage sorghum type, which still has some grain on it, but not traditional grains grain sorghum that would have a lot more grain relative to forage. We've looked at some BMR grain sorghum but it was a look at grazing the residue. And so I'm not familiar um, with any work on processing of the sorghum grain in sorghum silage. I think it would be a little challenging, um, but I'd have to look to see if there's any data first. And the reason I say it's really challenging is simply due to the, the berry size in, in, grain, in sorghum grain versus kernel corn. While you're on kernel processing, here's a question. Has UNL looked into the maturity at harvest in kernel processing? I assume this would be more important in growing diets and not as important in finishing diets uh, with a lower level of silage inclusion. Now that's a good question too. We have not looked at this interaction um, between dr the drier the silage gets, uh, conceptually you could argue the more important kernel processing would become. We've sort of looked at kernel processing and normal silage, and then we looked at normal and dry silage over here separately and not tested both at the same time. But it would be logical to me that if you have a little drier silage, kernel processing is a, a benefit in that situation. And I, I always am remiss and I forget to mention that the other advantage that a lot of people like about the kernel processing is the cobs that are also processed. And um, no one seems to like to see cobs building up in the bottom of the bunks. And so kernel process silage, their perception is anyway. And uh, there's probably good evidence for that, that the, that the cattle clean up the, the cobs as well. Now, all that said, it is also fair to say that the more silage you feed, in other words, a growing diet, hybrid selection, uh, kernel processing, anything you do to improve those silages is going to be more important than in a finishing diet with only 10 to 15 percent silage in it. So yes, I think the applications, if you're going to spend more money to try and improve the silage, the first place to consider using that would likely be in growing diets. Excellent. Here's, uh, here's a really good one. Uh, is there anything to the point that when feeding higher silage diets that cattle are fed longer, about 30 days, that means uh, the cattle turns per year are less, over numerous years are less. Does that make the enterprise less profitable, less marketed, I guess, assume le less cattle marketed? So yep. basically it's about uh, turnover and occupancy. That's a fair question. We, we In our economics, we've obviously paid an, a yardage to the feedlot for those extra days, okay? And I think in our scenario, we use 50 cents we could go to 60 cents. You know, I think those are true yard, what true yardages should be today um, versus some, you know, I know most people use a combination of a yardage charge plus a feed markup. In our scenario, we didn't mark up the feed. We were only using a true yardage charge. But so my point is, I guess, to the feedlots enterprise as a feeding unit, um, I don't care because I'm getting the yardage. In fact, it might make it easier I don't have to buy, bring in replacement cattle. 
Uh, if I am trying to market more cattle, I think it depends on your profitability, but yes, there will be less turnover, more less turns per year on average if you feed the cattle longer. But if you make more money, you know, so I, I guess I didn't think worry about that or think about it as a concern because we were paying yardage on the feedlot side. But so we've not looked at that, I guess, is what I should have said to begin with. Yeah, interesting. So here's an here's another one. By the way, Dan, sorry. Uh, oh, sure. I, this is a this is a joke, but it's not funny to most producers. You also lose less money, <laughs> right? If you're losing money on the turn. <laughs> this is true. So with the 45% silage inclusion, did the animals um, exhibit any different eating behavior, more sorting perhaps? Uh, not that we've observed. We had these diets, the 45% silage would have also included in all those studies, either 20 in some cases, or as, up high, as high as 40% uh, distiller's grains. So think about it. We had some studies where we've done 45% silage on a dry basis, 40% distillers, which if you do the math is 85% of the diet, right? But in most cases, and because most producers are feeding 20% distillers, most of our studies are 45% silage on a dry basis, 20% distillers, and then that kind of, and then either uh, dry rolled corn, high moisture corn blend or dry rolled corn, we haven't seen any soaring concerns, mostly because I think we've had with kernel processing, no cob buildup, and also pretty good mixes with that distillers in the diet as well. Good. So, uh, next question uh, on the trial with the 37 versus 43% dry matter, was there any data or observations on forage quality and feed out characteristics such as shrink and mold? Yeah, that's a good question. And I should have pointed out uh, we're not recommending the dryer silage for multiple reasons, but I also need to point out that the that study was done by us bagging the silage. And I recognize that drier silage would be more at risk for storage in a bunker and not getting the air out, right? And, and we've talked, previous speakers have discussed that air is the enemy. And so we first wanted to test it in as ideal of storage conditions as possible, which we thought would be a bag. Plus I didn't need bunkers full of this. I needed bags to, to get the right quantity. And then we thought, well, then if they feed the same and we think it might improve economics a little because you're hauling less water, then we'll go and work on the bunker storage and test it in those situations with different packing densities and so on. But we're not going to go to that next step because I don't think there's good enough evidence to go past uh, 37, 38% dry matter, meaning 62 to 63% moisture. But you know what happens, and everybody kind of knows this, everybody has an ideal target moisture in mind when they start, and most people don't hit it. And so I think people start either too early in most cases and, and get too anxious and then it's too wet. Um, and in some cases, whether that's weather driven or whatever, it can get too dry on you as well. And so I think this illustrates that you have some flexibility if it gets a little too dry, but there are going to be mold concerns and so on if you store this in a bunker. In our bags, we saw no concerns, no mold, no yeast growth, no storage concerns. But again, I think that's because of how we did it in our silo bags. Great, thank you. Um, we've got at least a couple more questions, and I think we'll try to, to hit, touch on both of those before we wrap up today. Um, the next question is, do you expect any advantage of storage time for over digestion and performance or with digestion and performance? Yeah, we've learned, I think, and, and um, maybe it was teaching here at Iowa State, Dan, I don't know. But you know, when I was taught, uh, we always thought that you put up silage, it goes through a fermentation process, and then three weeks later or four weeks later, it's done. And then it's, it's in siloed for the rest of the year. That's not really what happens. Um, most of the change and most of the stabilization occurs in the first three or four weeks. But over time, as that's stored longer, there continues to be change, albeit quite slow compared to the first three weeks. And we think uh, we've, we've, we've studied that better in high moisture corn than we have in silage. But I guess I would speculate that silage does continue to change some throughout the year. Okay, so what does that mean? 
that means that silage theoretically in the middle of the summer that's been stored for almost 300, 300 to 360 days should be more digestible than silage that has just been fermented and is, has been in, in silage for four weeks. Uh, I'd like supporting evidence for that in silage, but that would be our hypothesis, that it does get better with age, so to speak. At least I, I'm speculating that way because we do have good evidence for that in high moisture corn, that it does become more rapidly digested and more fermentable the longer it goes. Okay, excellent. Let's uh, take one more question, then we'll wrap it up for today. You talked about BMR and some other hybrids. What is your experience and opinion on the hybrid with high amylase activity. Make sure I'm clear that would be the Syngenta corn that they're talking about? You think? I, I assume so, Galen. That, that's all that was in the, the question, but uh, but I assume so. The speaker Make sure helped I clarify right. that. No, that's okay, Dan. You did say high amylase, right? Yes, amylase. Mm -hmm. Yeah, then that, that probably would be, because obviously there's amylose and amylopectin, right? So I just want to make sure it was the enzyme. Uh, we have done numerous studies with Syngenta uh, Inogen uh, feed corn. One of those was with silage, and I know Kansas State has done uh, at least one, I think maybe two uh, silage growing studies with uh, Inogen corn. And um, we, in the beef application, <clears throat> we've not seen, <clears throat> excuse me, we didn't see an improvement in the silage component. The Kansas State study that I'm familiar with did see an improvement. So those are those are a little conflicting. Not I don't know what to make of that. I'm just pointing out that there's been a little variation. Um, and if you look at the lab testing that's been done by Syngenta and others, some of the lab techniques that are used suggest that the silage would be improved as well. I have some concerns over that relative to how lab tests don't always translate to the cattle side. For instance, one of them is a short time disappearance. I'm always a little worried that I think this amylase corn does make the starch more degradable, which means it could wash out, but I don't know if that translates to digestibility in the silage. So I, I think the verdict is out some on the silage part. Although I do have to add that we don't see any improvement with um, antigen feed corn and high moisture corn. And if I look at the given that the amylase is in the corn kernel um, and that silage is essentially high moisture corn that's even higher in moisture, I would speculate no improvement in the silage, but I do know that's being tested and, and I reserve the right to be proven wrong. But um, I, I guess at this point, I, I think there's very good applications for the amylase corn, the antigen amylase corn. Probably my first choice would not be in silage. Very good. Yes, and just to confirm, that was what the question was about. And uh, Beth has indicated I forgot one question. Well, and this shouldn't take too long, but the question is, what was the stubble length in your studies when your silage was chopped? Excellent question. Yes, and especially when we talked about that percent grain cutting height matters. In our case, um, I, I don't remember exactly. I want to say it's twelve, to, you know, twelve inches roughly. Um, but I'd have to, uh, we'd have to go back to those individual studies. We do commonly monitor it and try not to, to change it. But in most of those silage studies where we harvest large quantities, field scale harvest, we're using a, a, a chopper. Uh, a forage processor just like everybody and uh, I think most of those would have been 12 inches and some of those studies where we looked at change over time we did some hand harvest and those we specified in those studies and in some cases was six inches and so on but cutting height does influence that proportion of grain. Excellent well with that I think we'll wrap it up for today so thank you Galen and thanks to all the speakers in our four uh, webinars and uh, be sure and tune in to the follow-up podcast that will be hosted by the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. And we thank you all for joining us. We'll, uh, we'll see you later.